So is, is my microphone on? Yes. Is it OK? And Farah, why don't you come up? And uh, I'm Joel Adelson. I'm a professor emeritus of um, social medicine and public health at UCSF in the Institute for Health and Aging. Uh, I'm semi-retired, and I never know when to stop. I'm also very um, user-friendly. And so you can hassle me as much as you like, and, and that would be fine. Um, and uh, I wanted to just introduce Farah Kashvipur, who was my dear and esteemed colleague in uh, Liberia. Um, she did her undergraduate work at UC Santa Cruz. She got her um, degree in nursing and master's in nursing at UCLA, um, and then another master's in uh, global health at UCSF. Uh, where she is now a fellow in global health uh, in program planning and research. And she has in the past worked in Central America and in Africa. So this wasn't her first trip. And uh, we will do this very much together, um, the seminar. And um, we will really try to do it together. And we will try to do it kind of casually. We are going to mix. Um, very non-academic, very emotional things, um, which may make me halt and cry. I don't know. Seriously. Maybe not. And maybe the same for Farah. Um, but we will also try to do some of the epidemiology, some of the public health, uh, some of the future of the Ebola epidemic. So with no further introduction, Farah. Okay. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Uh, is this okay? Great. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're really looking forward to this talk. And I'm just uh, curious to see uh, our audience, um, nursing students. Do we have nursing students in the audience at all? Medical students? It's uh, public health and PH students. Okay, so primarily public health. Great. But there's also some infectious disease folks. And uh, oh, I should have an others category. I'm sorry, oh, yes. infectious uh, disease. Uh, Shara, where and, you come from? A and bit. what? Yes, please. Infectious disease and any other. We're the infection prevention department from the medical center. Right. Oh, great, excellent. Thank you so much for coming. We, um, Joel and I, were involved in uh, IPC trainings uh, in uh, rural Liberia for several weeks, and um, we like to share those experiences as well. So uh, as you are all aware, this is the 25th known Ebola epidemic. And it's unprecedented in so many ways, uh, one of which is that this is the first time we've seen Ebola in North America. We have never seen it until this point. And Margaret Chan of the WHO Director General uh, declared this as um, worst public health crisis of our times. This is a viral illness, and it appeared in 1976. Um, and it, the name comes from uh, the Ebola River. However, uh, it's always happening in, in areas where there are rainforests. So maybe the name could also be named that, uh, from a rainforest. But that's where the name comes from. And the current epidemic, we have a case fatality rate of 50% if patients get treatment. Left. Um, untreated, the fatality rate is about 70%. And about 13 months ago, uh, a two-year-old boy in Southeast Guinea came down with the disease. And this area of Guinea is bordering Liberia and Sierra Leone. Anybody know how this one works? Oh, here, I can do that. Yeah. Can you? Mm -hmm. It's this. So right there ah, is where it started. And this uh, graph is actually only until to July 23rd, but I just really like the way it had put everything in perspective. And it doesn't have all 25 outbreaks, but just sort of shows the magnitude of cases. And the uh, epidemic started as this uh, spillover event occurs from an animal to human beings. So it's thought to have come from a fruit bat in this little boy. Um, whereas continuing infections are occurring between humans. So human-to-human -human contact through direct uh, transmission by bodily fluid uh, into the mucous membranes, eyes, nose, 
and others, um, and also objects like needles and infected syringes. And it's not spread through the air, so you could not get Ebola by sitting next to someone on the bus unless they threw up on you, or per se, or sneezed in, into your mouth, um, essentially. Um, so there's only one and only one sure way of controlling uh, and eliminating this disease, and this is done through triage and rapid isolation. And what this means is that we separate husbands and wives, we separate mothers from their infants, we break up siblings, we put someone's brother into an Ebola treatment unit to isolate while their sister is out at home, only to come later uh, with symptoms, maybe have Ebola, maybe not have Ebola, maybe have something else. And this is the most devastating part of this outbreak, uh, the isolation, the stigma. And Joel and I can speak to this uh, from a personal level because we were able to spend some time with these patients, not enough, obviously, uh, patients that are just going through so much pain in the Ebola treatment units. And I have worked in other settings, uh, resource-limited settings, but this was not something that I had ever encountered in terms of patient care having worked in a modern ICU at Stanford Hospital and having this experience here. Uh, so we, so we want to emphasize that aspect of it. And we also want to just um, highlight the fact that successful control integrates uh, case identification, surveillance, contact tracing, safe burials, a good laboratory uh, service, and also social mobilization. So we need all of these components to uh, contain Ebola in that setting in, in, in West Africa. And we're, we're going to talk about all these other uh, components later. <laughs> Joel, where did we go? Yeah. OK. And this is just a heat map that shows currently uh, Sierra Leone is suffering from the most number of cases, whereas um, Liberia was there in October with 300 cases or so in, at the peak of the epidemic, Liberia, and now they have something about five to eight cases per day throughout the country. So huge progress has been made in Liberia. Sierra Leone is uh, currently where there's a lot of cases. And this just shows the cumulative reported cases. Uh, you can see how Liberia has leveled off, sort of, Sierra Leone it's high, although some people say that there's also, there's, there's WHO's last report uh, conveyed that Sierra Leone may be leveling, leveling off as well. And incidentally, we arrived here, uh, we, this is when we arrived in Liberia, November 1st, and we left here. So um, this shows that Farah has had a strong impact on the incidence rate. <laughs> We just, we thought it was interesting that that happened, but yes, it's had nothing to do with us. Has to do with many, many months of uh, work that everyone has been doing. Uh, so just very quickly, signs and symptoms of the Ebola virus disease. I, uh, this was taken, I took this directly from uh, one of the posters that are, is used throughout the country. Um, these are everywhere. I mean, uh, this is one of the things I noticed um, as soon as we got off the plane, the, the signs and posters. Um, are just everywhere in Monrovia and also throughout the rural counties, uh, sometimes hours away from Monrovia, but they have put this uh, information out there for people to see, which goes to show uh, the effectiveness of the response. I think that, um, once again, uh, when, I note, when I noted that the control strategy needs to be everything um, combined with con contact tracing laboratory facilities and, and also just informing the public. So signs and symptoms, a uh, classic sign is uh, fever and uh, headache, malaise, uh, also nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Some of the more advanced uh, symptoms are unexplained bleeding, uh, bloody diarrhea, bleeding gums, um, uh, skin rash. Some people have hiccups. I had this uh, happen a lot when many of the patients that I was treating had hiccups. And that was actually one of the symptoms that would kind of indicate they're still uh, 
going through the, when we were trying to rule out whether uh, this person should be going to confirmed or not while we were waiting for test results. That was, that counted as a symptom many times. And Joel will talk about um, treatment in a little bit, but uh, first he's going to go through this algorithm. So this is a complicated algorithm that, that uh, tries to talk about, and I'm not going to explain it in detail, but it, it is what happens when a patient presents at a triage or at a small place, and uh, you're trying to distinguish whether they have Ebola or not. And I should say as a preference, a preface to this, that as the Ebola panic has spread, anybody who gets sick, anybody, with almost any set of symptoms other than something that is like a broken leg or something that is obviously not Ebola, headache, fever, malaise, vomiting, diarrhea, can be any disease. And the automatic assumption when patients present is that it's probably Ebola. And so what happens when you're with a group of people who are in Africa, who are healthcare workers as we were, and one day Farah got very nauseous, suddenly her reaction was, I've got Ebola. And I'm not going to reveal too much, but it is something that will freak you out unbelievably. The minute you start to feel ill, you think you've got that disease and you're going to die. That's what you think of. And it just takes over. It's really horrendous. Can I, now, just, can yeah. I just say what happened, though? Because I feel like <laughs> now, now it's the she story's out. The now the story's ghost. out. Um, uh, no, so I, I did become very, very nauseous, and it was within three or four days of the last time I had been inside an ETU with confirmed patients. So I, I knew that I had been around patients that had Ebola. Uh, it, it turns out I got food poisoning, and uh, the only way I found out is the next day I woke up and everyone else in the house, except for people that didn't eat the item I had, were sick. So then that, that was the moral of the story, just uh, eat whatever Joel is eating, <laughs> and you'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah. So the first thing that you want to know about a potential patient is, have they been exposed to Ebola? Have they attended a funeral and gone through a funeral ritual, including washing the body, which happens there? It's part of the ritual funeral, and it is normal and not weird. And have they been exposed that way? Have they cared for someone who has had Ebola? Have they lost a relative, a friend, someone close by in the village in the last days? Has there been an unexplained death? Anything like that indicates a probable contact. And if the patient with that contact history plus a series of symptoms that are compatible with Ebola, if that's the story, they get placed in the suspect ward immediately where that contact history is very powerful and very persuasive. If they have no known contact history, then the algorithm continues to talk about a series of three or more symptoms out of a list of about six or seven symptoms. And if they make that criterion, they also get admitted to the suspect ward. Now, the laboratory diagnosis is what confirms Ebola. And ideally, a laboratory diagnosis would diagnose something else or um, expand or contract the differential diagnosis. It would make it possible to distinguish certain diseases from Ebola. Uh, but this is the laboratory typically in most of Africa, most of this part of Africa, it's, they can do a little microscopy. They cannot do even a hematocrit or a hemoglobin. They can do no electric, uh, elect, electrolytes, electric lights. They can do no electrolytes. 
They can no, do, do no blood gases. They cannot do anything that you folks who are medical can do. The device shown here is a device that was being built in rural Africa, very rural Africa, by a um, US Army team, literally, uh, that had flown in. And they're putting together uh, a real-time PCR machine. This requires a very high-tech facility. And it is the only way to diagnose Ebola positively. So patients who are put in the suspect ward are having their blood drawn. And drawing blood is a terribly dangerous process. The blood is triple wrapped and transported to one of these machines. And if they're in rural Liberia, that means it will be several days at least before results can be brought back. And there are airplanes that refuse to carry the sample. There are all kinds of problems. You also want to distinguish whether they have malaria, if possible, or not. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But the malaria is diagnosable by a blood strip test, and they have that available. So that you can have simultaneous malaria and Ebola. So you'll want to treat for malaria. But at least you have that one positive diagnosis, which if the Ebola comes back negative and the malaria is positive, you'll have some better idea of where you're going. These are the various treatments that are available when people are admitted to the uh, unit, to the Ebola treatment unit. Um, and they are um, worth talking about for a moment. Most patients with Ebola will develop either a septic shock type picture or a hypovolemic shock type picture. They will have tremendous diarrhea and vomiting. They will become dehydrated. And in the setting of this massive epidemic, especially in its urban phase, which is probably lending, probably slowly ending now, the very possibility of hydrating somebody is poor at best. You can offer them oral rehydration solution to take by mouth. And a lot of times, they just can't get enough down. or They vomit it back up. They're too unconscious to take it. They're too little to understand to take it. There's not enough caregivers to monitor giving the oral rehydration solution. And so a huge number of patients go into shock hypovolemic shock first, and then sometimes a combination of septic and hypovolemic <laughs> shock. And they die right then, quick. I'll tell you about that more. For, so you try now, under calmer circumstances, to start IVs. Farah was in a unit which was starting IVs. I was in a unit that was not starting IVs. They were just beginning in the days before I left the unit in Monrovia to start IVs. I had, on my first set of rounds, a little nine-year-old girl. Her name was Philomena. And they had just the day before made the decision that they would start IVs on 12-year-olds. Philomena was nine. She was groggy. People were trying to give her capfuls of oral rehydration solution. I came back the next day, and she was gone. She was dead. That was very typical. Pain, typical drugs. Fever, they give acetaminophen, which is called paracetamol there. They try to comfort the stomach with omeprazole. They use benzodiazepines or Haldol for confusion, aggression, seizures, again, benzodiazepine, which you can give rectally if needed. And you often treat empirically for malaria if you have no diagnosis. And you give this combination drug. I forget the brand name. I think it's 
artemeter or something like that. What is that? Yeah, cortem. And you give that combination that's there. Which one did you push for this? This one. No? OK. So here's a story. And I'm going to tell one story. And then Farah will tell you another story. And these are just personal things. This woman you see here on the right is a Danish nurse. And she's in the triage area in Monrovia. An ambulance has arrived behind her. And somebody in personal protective equipment has been looking at the patient and talking to the patient and taking the patient's temperature and has tried to write down and to communicate across this wide barrier to the nurse what's going on. Now, I'm not going to show the patient's picture. A woman came in with her son. He was eight, and he was cute, and she looked healthy, and he looked a little bit drowsy and unsteady, and he had a very low-grade fever, and she attested that he had had a fever the night before, and she had given him acetaminophen. And he had vomited once, as I remember it. So his symptoms were mild and very questionable. Given that alone, you would not admit him to the Ebola treatment unit. But his dad had been admitted 36 hours earlier with now confirmed Ebola. And he and the mom, the boy and the mom, had been caring for the dad at home like anybody else would. They'd been in contact with the dad. This was a strong indication that the boy may have Ebola. And he's admitted. People come out in this kind of personal protective equipment. And they gently but firmly pull the boy away from his mother. And she encourages him to go because his daddy is inside. And he'll be with his dad. And he goes in. And the mother is sent down the street to another tent to get cleanup equipment for her home. She goes down the street. And just as she leaves, our phone rings. And we have the news that the dad is dead. And we have just sent this boy in. And we are all just freaked out. I'll cut the story short. A few minutes later, we hear the mother who has gone down to that place screaming and screaming and screaming. She wants his body, the husband. She wants the wedding ring. They've all been cremated. She will not have a body. She will not have a wedding ring. And the boy does not have a father. And he's just gone in there by himself. All of us, including Kirsten, are crying. It's horrible. One of the Liberian nurses tells us that this was no way to inform the mother. We should have gotten a relative to talk to the mother with us. But that's not going to happen. It's all, all going wrong. And then the mother comes back to us. And she's just a wonderful mother. What does she do? She tells us that she has Ebola. 10 minutes earlier, she didn't have any symptoms. We interviewed her. Now she has Ebola. She's had a fever. She's got vomiting and diarrhea and anything you want. She wants in. She wants to be with her son. Big confab. We let her into the unit. She goes in. She takes the boy to her. She tells him to be strong, that she's going to be strong. She does not tell him right then about the father. A few hours later, we hear that his initial test for Ebola has come back negative. 
I never heard what happened to her initial test for Ebola. I don't know whether he had Ebola or he didn't. I don't know whether either one of them or both of them are alive or dead. It's industrial scale moving patients through, and it is just, that's an Ebola story. Farah. You want to talk about this, or should I? Either one. You can go ahead. OK, this is just a diagram of an Ebola treatment unit. It's a huge place. These places are rapidly becoming what we used to call white elephants. They're probably not necessary. They can treat many, many patients, and there aren't many in huge groups to treat. But it basically has an area which is a kind of green zone where everybody can move around, and you don't have to wear personal protective equipment. And it has a triage area where you find the patients, you admit them there, and they go to the suspect area. And the suspect area is very contagious. It's the same as the confirmed area. The only difference is that the patient's Ebola tests have not yet come back. So they're treated in exactly the same way as the true Ebola patients. And some 60, 70, 80 percent of them will have Ebola during the epidemic. The others will be discharged after three days of a negative test. If the test comes back positive, they are put into the Ebola treatment unit confirmed side where the treatments continue, such as they are. And this side is super infectious, so is the, so is the suspect side. And the patients will either die there and be taken to the morgue and then cremated immediately within the facility or buried, depending on the ETU you're at, Ebola treatment unit, or they will make it and they will be discharged. And about half of them will make it. And this means that there's a lot of dead people, as you will hear. And the note about this diagram is, um, is my pointer? Oh, I lost the pointer. Oh, right here. Uh, the note about this diagram is the red arrows are the patient pathways. So this is where the patient would come in through the triage. They first get admitted to suspect. They get their test results. Then they go to confirmed. And for staff, we have this purple or whatever color this is, this pathway. And the point is it's a, it's a one-way direction. You do not go back between these pathways. Uh, sections, you just go from, once you get changed, you go through suspect. You don't go from confirmed to suspect, you just, and then you exit and doff. And um, this is a picture of the uh, Ebola treatment unit in Bong County, which is four hours away from Monrovia. Uh, I was there, uh, where that's, this is where I received my hot training, as it's called. Um, and what I wanted to share here was as a nurse who has worked in, in ICUs in developed countries here and have had access to very fancy equipment. And I've also worked out in the community in rural areas in various countries. This was one of the most, by far one of the most difficult experiences I've had as a nurse as, and as someone that uh, is, is sort of trained to provide care and address needs, whether it's getting someone a glass of water or it's to call a code and you know, you know, give chest compressions. I received training at the CDC for three days. Uh, we, we practiced getting in and out of the personal protective equipment. And then we did the same thing here in Bong County uh, before we entered the, the zone. We went through so many exercises. And here, everyone shares experiences about uh, what it will be like, and this is what we have to do. Infection control, you just wash your hands with 0.5% chlorine once you're inside. You make sure you check in with yourself and with your buddy, you always go with another person. So you don't, in case you start to feel dizzy, you, that person can just sort of say, okay, you need to go, or someone, you're always checking in with each other so you're not just out there by yourself and, um, you know, God forbid, like collapse because then you just created a whole lot of other problems. So I go through so much training and I sit through and I listen for three days at the CDC and then we fly out, we receive more trainings. And finally, it was my turn. I had to do it. I had to get dressed and I had to go inside. And a lot of it was exactly like everyone explained. It was already really hot and as soon as I started putting the layers on, 
I just started getting really, really warm and sweating, and it was just like everyone had explained. But then there was this other sort of uh, emotional side where everyone's experience is unique to themselves. Everyone's going to feel one way or another. And for me, the, just knowing that I had no idea what, what, what the inside was going to be like, but just knowing how hard it is and that people were dying, and I'm used to reviving patients. I, I, I work in the ICU when I'm not at the uh, university. So I walk in and I go through and I'm tasked with uh, hanging IV fluids for patients. Um, this is dark hallway and it's blue tarps just like it, you can see. And the reason there are not many pictures of inside the ETU is because anything you take in has to be incinerated or has to be dunked in 0.5% chlorine. And so there are not really many pictures of these places, but they're really, they're really, really difficult to, to be inside as, as a healthcare provider, but as patients as well and as families. It's dark, it's wet, there are buckets with you know, urine or vomit or diarrhea, and everyone is spraying chlorine. And you, I couldn't smell it as much because we have two layers of masks over our face, but I can only imagine that patients are just smelling so much chlorine because there's 0.5% chlorine just being blasted on walls and beds and floors, and we are just you know washing it. If so you just want kind to imagine what hell looks like, that's what it looks like. Yeah, it, it's it's just really it's just really really difficult. It's very hot. So I, I the first couple of patients that I see are are they look great? They're sitting on their beds, they're eating breakfast, and this is this this is part of the morning rounds. And I enter the, the, the third room, and I, there are three women in the, in the room, and I, uh, I say hi to the other two, and we kind of you know, get temperatures. And, and I notice that the other woman whom I have to give the IV fluid to is not interacting. So I go up to her bed, and I notice that she's actually face down on her bed, and that she's actually already dead. And for me, initially, I, as, as I said, I just remember I had this like, gut reaction of like wanting to run out and like asking for help, like, you know, we have to call a code, so to speak. Um, but I had to just kind of stop myself and realize that her roommates already knew she was dead and it had, death had just become so routine and that they saw it and they accepted it as part of this tragic epidemic. They had just accepted that their roommate had died and that we were eventually going to get to it, so to speak, um, and we were going to remove her body and do the proper recording of her name and case number. And this was just extremely difficult, extremely difficult, which kind of goes to the patient care. The next slide. Here, we, Joel and I wanted to discuss uh, some of the roles of healthcare providers inside one of these units um, and how fluid and blended physician, nurse, nurse assistant, uh, epidemiologist, uh, directors, anyone that went in sort of did whatever they could if, if it was to grab you know, a towel or a shirt for someone or, or give medications or um, you know, help, help a patient drink some more uh, oral rehydration salts. Uh, everyone did everything that they could. And I thought that that was just incredibly, incredibly heartwarming and part of the reason I felt compelled to, um, to also share these experiences with you was uh, in, in the West sometimes we forget because we have so much time so you know maybe, uh, maybe I will go in the room and the patient's asking for something and I can say oh I'll tell the nursing assistant or I'll call so and so or but when you're, when you're inside the ETU it's very humbling because we're all just there to address patients' needs and to give them the best care that we can. And it's, it's so bad, the care that we're giving patients. But we just try, and we, you leave sort of feeling just useless, essentially. But, but we work really well together. Everyone works extremely well. There's no sort of hierarchical, like, uh, you know, no, you do this, you do that. The, the delegation and the working together piece is, is amazing. I want to just you know, sort of make a, a, a more academic social medicine point out of that, which is that um, the actual structures of uh, medical care there are uh, traditionally hierarchical. So the doctors should be at the top, except the doctors have all fled in huge numbers, and there were never huge numbers to flee. So a large percentage of them, so there's almost no national doctors. The next rank 
is something called the physician's assistant, which was a long story, and I won't tell it now. And they are blended kind of with nurses and with other kinds of people who are helping in the ETU. And then on top of that, because the ETUs are mostly being run by uh, NGOs from the United States or France or elsewhere, uh, you have these, they have their own hierarchical structures that they bring with them. And so the whole thing ends up to be a sort of strange blend of blended duties and so forth, along with a kind of residual hierarchy that is a little strange. That's all I can say about it in this period of time. We can talk about it later a little bit. Here is a young boy who is about to be discharged. He's survived Ebola, and he's being cared by this caregiver who has brought him over so he can wave at his family, perhaps, or at the other caregivers. You want to notice that this boy will not recognize this caregiver by his or her face. And I don't know whether this is a man or a woman. I don't know whether it's a doctor or a nurse. I know only that that's a little boy. And uh, this is typical. When the patients are finally discharged, if they make it, there is a huge new world that opens up. They come out of their out of the Ebola treatment unit, they meet, and I'll, we'll have some patient stories. I think we don't have it here. But they will meet their caregivers for the first time. And they will see the caregivers' faces, and they will recognize the caregivers' voices. The caregivers have really come to love their patients. I mean, if weeks and weeks of exposure to these people who are surviving the most horrible disease you can imagine, and then if they're young, and sometimes even if they're not so young, they dip their hands in either blue or pink paint, and they leave their handprint on the wall, and they go home to who knows what, a family that is entirely dead and they are orphans? Many. A family that is half dead and they are semi-orphans? A community that is in some way very full of superstition and they don't know how to handle or re-accept the patients back, it's very difficult. And they are given a certificate, typical Western style, you've graduated from an Ebola treatment unit, and hopefully uh, this is going to convince a village out in the jungle that this patient is not infectious and is nothing special. They should accept this person back into the village. Good luck. Community engagement and social mobilization. So this is a huge area. The issues of how do you mobilize the community, how do you educate? In the urban areas, once the government of Liberia, and they have a wonderful president, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, I think is her last name, Nobel laureate. It took weeks and weeks to convince her. And then it took months for Doctors Without Borders, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, to convince the World Health Organization that they had to stomp on this disease. The World Health Organization finally, as Farah quoted, recognized this as the worst thing since ever, and only reluctantly did that. There's a lot of analysis in the press about why that took so long. We won't talk about it now. We can talk about it later if you want. And then finally, the CDC was on site and trying to get in and wasn't allowed in at first, especially in the other countries except Liberia. And finally, it was able to contribute and then USAID and a lot of money and Obama and so forth. And then begins the process of going into villages, educating the villages, getting the villages to overcome their tendency to literally drive the healthcare workers out because they think the healthcare workers are bringing Ebola in, 
being able to recognize that they have to stop the burial practices that they were doing because it infects the entire village. And radio, television, text messaging, announcements, posters everywhere. And it is just a massive, massive attempt to try to educate and get through. And uh, just, to, just a note about this sign, we wanted to uh, note the importance of getting religious leaders and uh, village uh, chiefs and community leaders on board. This is, we uh, encountered this when we were uh, going around uh, one county in Liberia and going through infection prevention practices with uh, different clinics. And everyone, uh, so as we entered every village, we spoke with the village chief and let them know why we were there. And, and these are sort of the public health implications of um, when emergency response just uh, enters a, a crisis, how, how we have to actually understand the context and, and be sensitive to what is actually happening and what's the order of things are. You know, we don't just go in a village and we don't just start training people. We need to speak with the village chief and, 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 and that is actually more effective because then everyone in the village is, is also on board. I'm, I'm, we're going to have to sort of hurry it up. So I'm, I'm just going to see if you can read out just the number of dead healthcare workers. Um, yes, so we have a total of 488 from all three countries. And uh, this was from an article uh, in NPR uh, December 31st. Uh, this person went and tried to find as many pictures as they could to try to uh, sort of give a face to this, this hidden tragedy that we don't, we don't hear so much about. Uh, but they are also in that kind of cumulative number of deaths. Um, here uh, is an example of one of the classes that we held out uh, with, with, com with uh, clinic members, mainly uh, nurse midwives and uh, vaccinators, um, county health teams, uh, contact tracers. And I'm uh, playing a patient here. And uh, the national staff gave the lectures. And uh, what uh, Paul Farmer has uh, noted many times is strengthening health systems requires staff, stuff, uh, space, and systems. And this was, we, this, we felt this. We saw this exactly uh, as it, as it uh, kind of unfolded in front of our eyes. We went through clinics and saw that there were only a few pairs of PPE. There was not enough. Uh, people to do contact tracing. Uh, and you know, so CDC would supplement um, contact tracers or WHO would help out with something and uh, UN would help out with burials. And so that, that was the personnel issue. And there was no system in place, e either a um, electronic medical records or even internet or cell phones sometimes, which makes everything just difficult, just difficult. Should tell a story about Farah just quickly uh, we traveled together for about five hours to a very, very rural place. We spent the night there, and then uh, my little group went off in one direction a couple of hours and taught in a little village and came back at night to this original place five hours from Monrovia. Farah and two others drove another five hours, total of 10 hours over the worst roads in the world and ended up sleeping in a hut with a healthcare worker who gave up her bed, put Farah and another person in the bed. They're staring up at the ceiling with giant bugs hovering overhead. The healthcare worker sleeping under her normal bed, and it's not easy. That's all I can say. Vaccines and antivirals are on their way. Shelley is showing me the time is up. This is what hopefully is a white elephant Ebola treatment unit. This is where we were originally planning to go and treat lots of patients, and the patients never materialized, but the unit finally did. And that's the road ahead. If you can get there, and that's an actual picture of the road. <laughs> And you can see the two trucks on either side are actually dug into mud and cannot move. I wanted to make one other comment um, because of some of the folks here. We were talking about um, the general future of Ebola, and I just want to take one more minute. Right now, it looks like there will be a slow 
and hopefully steady decrement in the number of acute cases which will be beaten down to a lower level. But Ebola has come out of the forest and has gone from being purely a zoonosis to what I think can be called seriously an endemic disease in the human population now. <coughs> if that disease and when that disease spreads on very rare occasions to Western Europe, the United States, or any place else that is highly developed, it will be contained both by isolation and quarantine, and on top of that, people will get intensive care, and they will almost all be cured. We have seen that now about eight or 10 times in Europe and the United States. Elsewhere, the disease is spreading inexorably in smaller numbers over wider and wider geographic areas into villages that frequently do not report the disease until a dozen people are dead and the disease is found to be going on there. The national borders, and you can read this in the press, have no validity. People move by trail, by canoe, by foot, by car, by motorbike, among and between villages, and they infect village after village. Trying to get that down to the point where it is only a zoonosis again is going to be extremely slow and extremely hard. A vaccine will help. But then you will have a deal like polio, which is endemic in the human population. And 60 years after the vaccine, we had some 400 cases of polio last year in Afghanistan, the Sudan. So when I have bad dreams, I see Ebola reaching Lagos, Nigeria a city of 10 million people, largely slums, or Cairo, or Boko Haram, I don't know. So thank you, and we're really happy to have questions. Okay. Right. Questions, please. We have some time, and then they can stay a little bit longer. Well, that would be two of us. Um, for me, uh, I had to go. I, it, it just wasn't any, I, I, that was my first thing. I have to go. And then it was, I'm too old. And then it was, I am, I'm too old. And, and, and then it was, why am I worrying about this? I've, I've had a good life, really. And I've had 73 years of good life. So that was a little easier. Um, I wasn't sure I was strong enough. I really wasn't in some ways. I did not do well in the ETU. I couldn't balance on one foot to get sprayed. So I worried them in the ETU. Uh, but um, it was everything. It was also an element of adventure and really wanting to help. And I've done enough. And Farah? For me, I, I get a, a large degree of personal gratification doing uh, any kind of work where I feel my, my, I'm making a contribution in any way. And also, it really motivates me. I think uh, having worked in uh, hospitals in the US, sometimes we forget just how privileged we are. And, it, and it's so true. And I, it's just so gratifying. It's, it's so eye opening to see that. Um, healthcare workers in resource limited areas are doing the work that we're doing with so little and they're extremely innovative. They're extremely uh, brilliant. They just, they literally just have those roads and they don't have enough of the stuff. But it makes, it makes me understand um, kind of our own limitations in the, in the West sometimes and how we can maybe find ways to not be as wasteful, for example, in the hospitals or what, what, what we can actually do. And I think the global health uh, piece of it, because, because I'm doing this program planning, it kind of helps me uh, put things in context as we you know, look at 
different programs that we're designing or uh, we're getting funding to do. And so I, I felt like I, you know, I, I'm a nurse and I'm in global health. I have to go and I have to see. Um, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, so in, in the unit that I was, it was a 52-bed uh, ETU. There were 20 beds in suspect, and for the most part, they kept those rooms, uh, one patient per room. However, something that we noticed right away is that patients move around. In fact, they move their beds, they go sleep in a different bed. So you, you think patient so-and-so is in room two, but now they're in room six. So um, I think they, um, they encouraged patients to wash their hands and to use the buckets and to not have, because they didn't know the status of other patients. And for example, if we had a mother and a child, uh, we encouraged the mom to use a, just a gown, like minimal PPE, we called it, um, so, that, so that just in case the baby has it or the mom has it, it just creates some barrier. But I think, uh, unfortunately and sadly, many people must have gotten infected just by the way of, but rapid testing helps with that, right? So once the US lab opened up in this county, we had test results in four hours. So you could admit a patient and in four hours know if that patient has Ebola or not and um, uh, transfer them to the confirmed uh, area. Other questions? I hope uh, the people who are uh, released from the treatment centers are given a handful of condoms Yes, so thank you for that. And I, I also wanted to add something to that. Yes, um, what he's pointing out is that uh, it is thought that the virus is sheltered even after the blood tests have become negative. The virus may be sheltered in, uh, in sperm or in semen. And uh, so they are given condoms um, and asked to use the condoms for several months after discharge. It also leads to uh, some main point that I wanted to raise earlier that we wanted to raise, which is that patients who get out, adult patients especially, who get out of the unit are thought to be immune. And many of them heroically will volunteer to go back into the unit Without PPE, they can do that because they're immune and they can help care for patients. They can also counsel and so forth. And that has become a mainstay. And it's very important that that happens. There's potential use of immune serum to give immunity between patients or to treat infected patients. That's important and that's happening. There's a whole series of vaccines that are currently under test, both in the West, in Europe, and in the United States, and Canada. Um, and there are vaccines that are being tested in West Africa now. Uh, we are many months from widespread vaccination. We may be a few months from limited vaccination. And there are antivirals that are being tested now. And uh, there's mixed results so far. We don't know. Um, but I, I just wanted to throw that in. Final question? Oh, go ahead. Did you Please? also have to go through training at CDC? And I'm wondering if there is a, a bottleneck of um, experts who want to go, but you have to go through this three days. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, what has happened now is that the CDC has stopped the separate training. And the various um, contributing organizations who are sending people are training themselves, either on site in the United States, as Partners in Health is now doing, or in an Ebola treatment unit in West Africa, or in West Africa, and then in an Ebola treatment unit. It's, uh, it's becoming. It, it, I cannot tell you how complex the logistics are and how confusing it is, not only for training, but how do you route people. 
We've had a terrible time with rooting people to Liberia and then having to reroute them to Sierra Leone. And I don't know what's going on in Guinea because that's not either, that's not in the purview of the US or Britain. It's in the purview of France. It, and getting supplies and so forth. I can tell you that MSF, Doctors Without Borders, is amazing. They are extremely well funded. They are incredibly aggressive. They get in trouble with the governments with which they have to coordinate. Uh, but they have their own supply lanes and everything else. You look at an Ebola treatment unit, it's a huge place with all kinds of plumbing and, and materials and supplies and how do you house the people and how do you feed them and so forth, not just the patients but the, the caregivers. It's amazing, very difficult. If you can go and you're willing, go. And I just, I'll just add, if anyone has any questions, we can give out our emails to, um, to just directly email us, and we will be very, very happy to share photos or questions. I also have two manuals for clinicians and non-clinicians, and these are from WHO. You can look. If anyone wants to see them, they're up here. You can just thumb through one for a minute, and that's fine. On behalf of all of us? I'd like to thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Thank you for And we're very grateful. Thank you very much.